right, thank you for staying with the Monday Report. We'd like to hear your views on every topic that we're going to talk about here. Travel and at Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Monday Report. Let me set the stage so that you understand where we're coming from. Tonight, the National Syndemic Diseases Control Council is raising an alarm over increased cases of new HIV infections among the adolescent population aged 10 to 19. A report released by the Kenya Health Information Systems shows that Embakasi North leads in cases of sexual gender-based violence and new HIV infections among adolescents as well as teenage pregnancies commonly known as the triple threat. The National Syndemic Disease Control Council has kicked off a sensitization campaign on ending the triple threat targeting adolescents in Dandora. Mary Muoki caught up with a young adult who has experienced the triple threat of teenage pregnancy, HIV infection and sexual gender-based violence. At only 23 years old, Meridian Atieno is a single mother of two children. But today she wears the heart of a peer educator. She is one of the panelists on this sensitization campaign in Dandora organized by the National Syndemic Diseases Control Council to raise awareness on ending the triple threat of HIV, teenage pregnancy and sexual gender-based violence among adolescents. As a peer educator, she has lived each of those threats on a personal level and knows only too well the burden of that. Born in a poor background, the odds were stacked against her long before she entered puberty. I was in class two. Yeah. I don't know. It was 207. I'm born 99. I had to sleep with a man for him to buy me a bairo pen. And my mom was alive. My dad was alive. And they didn't know. And it's like they didn't care. Meridian blames her poor background for her early debut in sex. She says when she was in Form 2, she had to trade sex for school fees. When I come back from school, I could get the, the man has already sent me fare. So I was to travel from Ushago to Nairobi. Uh, Sunday Usiku, I travel back. So when I travel back, the man could give me 1,000 school fees. In her own admission, Meridian dropped out of school and became a teen mom. She has experienced and endured the whole spectrum of the triple threat from teenage pregnancy, HIV infection, and sexual-based gender violence. But she is now using her experiences to educate adolescents to avoid the pitfalls she fell into. At least 98 new HIV infections were recorded every week among adolescents aged 10 to 19. The report also shows that one in every five adolescent women aged 15 to 19 are already mothers or pregnant with their first child. In 2021, 21% of all pregnancies were among adolescents aged 10 to 19. That uh, there is a disproportionate um, um, numbers of uh, girls being violated, especially in, in, in uh, poor urban families. According to the 2021 HIV subcounty estimates, 4% of adolescents 10 to 19 new infections in Nairobi County are from Embakasi. Kenya Health Information System data indicates that 5% of the total adolescent pregnancies in Nairobi County for the year 2022 were from Embakasi North. The Kenya Demographic Health Survey 2020 22 report indicates that 13% of women reported that they had experienced sexual violence at some point in their lives and 7% reported that they had experienced sexual violence in the last 12 months. The report also highlighted that the percentage of women who have experienced sexual violence increases with age from 7% among those aged 15 to 19. We are also seeing the interaction between pregnancies, um, sex work, uh, sometimes when the young girls get pregnancy, pregnant and they are struggling with uh, period poverty, they now start struggling for the baby with food. And that's why we are here today. The National Syndemic Diseases Control Council has embarked on a rigorous campaign across the country to end the triple threat that impedes ending AIDS as a public health threat in the country. Mirimoki, Citizen TV.
And that is the conversation we're having with my panelists in studio here, Dr. Ruth Laibon Masha, CEO, National Syndemic Disease Control Council. Thank you so much for making time. Also, we have Lucy Wanjikunjenga, Executive Director, Positive Young Women Voices, Asante Sana for making time. Also, Joyce Ouma is here, Campaign Officer, Y Plus Global. Thank you so much for making time. And Ahmed Said, Executive Director, Kuala Network of People Who Use Drugs, Asante Sana for making time. Dr. Marshall, start with you on this conversation. Let's break it down. Let's break down the triple threat into those three, HIV, teenage pregnancies, and SGBV. So let's start with the HIV part. Kenya committed to ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Are we on track? So I think the first thing that uh, we could say is that we have made progress, but the progress is not uh, fast enough to get us where we want to go. And one of the things that we did commit is that uh, we would have, um, for example, less than 5% transmission of HIV from mother to child. And that was by 2015. And so we keep missing this uh, small little milestone that would let us get where we want to go. Secondly, we still see the new HIV infections among um, young people not really um, slowing down that we would have expected to get us to 2030. And that is the deaths, the AIDS-related deaths. Uh, and that is where the challenge also uh, becomes significant because what we want to do by 2030 is that uh, to make AIDS um, uh, not a public health problem, but rather that we already have uh, reduced new infections to an insignificant level. And then also we want to see that uh, those who are living with HIV also are not uh, dying due to AIDS-related deaths. So what I would say is that we are making progress, but that progress is being clawed back by the new infections among children and among adolescents. And then again, we see that the older generation that had HIV uh, when they were infected in uh, yester years uh, or when they were younger, they are also growing older. And we have about 800,000 uh, of people living with HIV, about uh, 35 and above. And this also is a challenge because um, uh, if we have the ones that we have been putting on treatment for long and then you have new ones coming in, then it means that uh, the, our journey towards adding AIDS has become a really big challenge. Yeah. Joyce, as a young person, why isn't this message sinking? Masha says we're making progress but not fast enough and missing milestones. Why isn't this message sinking, especially to the younger generation? Um, interesting question. Well, the message is actually sinking. It depends on how the message is given. Most of the time, um, you find that the message that is being given to the young people is in form of threats. Like, if you don't do this, you will die. If you don't take care of yourself, then you get HIV. So if you go and maybe have raw sex once, you go test after three months, you don't get HIV, what does that mean? The person who gave you this information kind of lied to you. So what I'm trying to, to bring up is that for a very long time, progress has been made. We agree, progress has been made, a lot has been done, but yet the young people continue to bear the brunt of you know, the, the HIV burden. We get um, a lot of numbers, the figures that have been read today are very scary, yes? Um, but it's mostly because the programs are not being tailor-made to the young people themselves. We've made a lot of progress. We currently have a lot of youth-led organizations also doing outreaches and so supporting their own peers, um, which is a great thing, which is a good thing. And also, um, when, when I was coming on this panel, I, I remember asking uh, between Lucy and, and, and Dr. Marsha, who actually invited me on this panel. And she invited me on this panel, which is a beautiful thing because then that, it, that means it's an investment in youth leadership. It's also a recognition that young people are experts and young people are able to guide and you know support the implementation of these particular programs. So we are doing about right, but if we bring young people on board fully, uh, meaningfully and ethically, then definitely we are going to be moving in the right direction. Yeah, Lucy, how should this message be passed across? Because Joyce says it comes in forms of threats and maybe that's the reason why young people are willing to gamble with it. So I try it once, I don't get it, it means you lied to me so I can do it again. And then now all of a sudden you have it. Yeah, yeah. I agree with Joyce. It has to be consistent. I think where we miss out is uh, the consistency part. So today you are told this thing, you're not told again tomorrow. You tend to, to ignore it uh, because it's not as consistent and also it's not correct. Where are you getting this information? I was telling Dr. Ruth the other day, a girl came to us. Um, she's living with HIV. She, just got, she had just gotten tested and then we told her, 
go and get on treatment. You know, this is something you can you can maneuver around. And she came back three months later and said uh, she does not understand how she's not cured. How is she still HIV positive? Why will she still continue take, to take medication? So you find that it, it's the information. Somewhere along the way, we miss out. And I think those are the loopholes that we need to now engage young people, as Joyce has, is saying, yeah. so we know where is it we are missing at. It, it might be very minute. It might be, uh, I was telling someone also today, Coca-Cola, uh, the, the adverts, you see them every day. When you go to uh, to the shops, all you're thinking is, I want to buy Coca-Cola, because you see it on your face every day. But HIV along the way, uh, SGBV and, and, um, and teen pregnancies, it's something we talk about, and then we forget, yeah. until we see a spike, and then we come back again. Mm -hmm. It has to be consistent. Okay. Said and the people you're dealing with, what are they telling you? How come this message is not reaching home? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Trevor. And I think uh, before I say anything, I want uh, just to say thank you to Dr. Marsha because uh, he actually affirmed the principle of harm reduction number five that uh, we ensure that the people who use drugs or with history of drug use should be having the real voice in the program that is designed and the policies belongs to them. And I think that's the message that uh, we really need to pass across because if you see, uh, let's say for the prevalence of the HIV for the people who uh, inject drugs, it was initially 18.3, now is it 18.7. So I think uh, what we really need is that involvement. We need to be not considered as just the people at the patient end or beneficiary end, but I think we need also to be involved as benefit as a partner mm -hmm. because at the same time we might be having challenges based on the drug use, based on uh, uh, issue to do with uh, mental health, but at the end of the day we can also sit on the table and give ideas Ideas and this idea can bear fruits. Other countries have done that. Portugal have done that. And uh, even Amsterdam has done that. So I think here in Kenya also, we can do that and we can fight together. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Masha, there's been quite a number of issues that have been raised. One, threats. Two, consistencies. And then yourself, you said that progress is not fast enough. What are the intervention measures for this? How do we ensure that this message is more consistent and it is devoid of threats? Trevor, I know, uh, I think uh, we acted almost surprised uh, in the recent uh, demographic health survey when we had the levels of knowledge for of HIV prevention were very, very low, including even adult men at 55%. And as then you even look at the ones that have not gone to school, the knowledge levels for girls are about 18 percent. So we have argued for a long time and the argument has been what we should we teach, should we not teach, what we teach. And so it's left us in almost um, a comical situation because we then all of us all of a sudden say we must teach. But then when you say let's start teaching, we say who must teach, what must we not teach. Mm. And that's the politics <coughs> that we must stop around adolescents and young people. Yeah. Because we have to realize that uh, there is something that is broken, the social fabric that we assume is a culture, because we all talk about culture. But if I ask today what is our culture, we don't know. Because we say we are uh, safeguarding a culture, but the culture is already broken. We have no longer having grandmothers with us to teach us. We don't have the aunt system. We don't have so many systems that then we are saying we are trying to break. So what are we living? We are living a gap. And when this gap is around social media, the, 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 the whatever the children can take, even if it's not age appropriate. But then when we come to the table, like when we're here now, we start saying the one being taught by the teacher may not be age appropriate. Mm. So basically for me, I think education, education, education. And that education needs to be presented in a manner that is not what um, Joyce just said, it's not a threat. It's an agency building. Uh, uh, I've been saying this for a long time, for example, had we have sufficient agency, for example, for a young person who, who wants to uh, have sex, mm. to think about a condom. Why is it that it's possible for, for the same young person to have the agency to think about, um, let me, for example, buy um, a, a, a post, I mean, a, a 
a, 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 a drug for emergency uh, care for against pregnancy, but then they don't think about, for example, buying that condom, is because our message is probably is true that they are not giving the person um, information that is sufficient to see protection as a personal responsibility. So we want to shift that to a manner that is consistent first of all, but also acknowledges that it has to be inherent from a person uh, point of view. Yeah. As from when they are young, to begin thinking about the way they brush their teeth. Yeah. It's the way they also take care of their sexual health needs. And if we do that, every age, we start teaching basic steps, including uh, one of the challenges we found the other day was uh, um, a young person, a young girl who was saying she's not pregnant because she never had sex and yet she's pregnant. And when you ask her, do you know what sex is? She couldn't define sex. She only said, oh, are you talking about what I've been doing with my brother? You know, and she has been playing in the house with a small, with her brother. And then she talks about her brother and the other small brother of the games they've been doing in that house. And you can imagine the disaster within a family where they realize that this girl then is pregnant uh, with, of, of incest from the same young children in, in the household. Yeah. So that's a conversation you must have. We must break the complacency that we have already um, uh, surrounded ourselves with. Yeah. And that's the way it must go. That's interesting. But Joyce, isn't there a possibility that in the attempt to break down the stigma, mm -hmm. then now we've created a rather cavalier attitude towards HIV and AIDS. I have some friends of mine who tell me everyone can take drugs and they look fantastic actually with the drugs. So this is not a big deal. I mean, you just have your fun. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you make sure that we don't develop a cavalier attitude mm -hmm. as we try to break down the stigma? Wow. Um, some time back when I was getting into the activism field, I used to uh, speak about my status a lot, like how it's okay to, to how you can live a normal life even though you're living with HIV. And I used to get this question a lot, like why are you sugarcoating HIV? Why are you making people to prefer getting HIV and fear pregnancy? I think right now where we are at with young people is pregnancy is, pregnancy cannot be hidden. Uh, a lot of people will see the pregnancy, will ask who is the father, what, 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 but then your HIV is just your own. And we used to get this question a lot. And the one thing that I kept saying is that while we make it look easy, it's not easy. Mm. Taking a pill every day in order to survive, in order to see tomorrow, is, is not easy. So that is one message that we always accompany with uh, when telling people about, uh, you know, uh, HIV, for example. We do not want the stigma around HIV. The stigma around HIV starts from the stigma around sex. We are in a situation where we do not want to admit the young people are having sex. We do not want to admit that um, young women, for example, do not know how to negotiate condom use. Because, well, when I walk into a facility right now as a young woman who is sexually active, I'm just going to be given the male condom, like a whole box of it, you know? And that leaves the power to negotiate safe sex in the hands of the man. So now I'm bringing in a conversation around the inequalities as well that also um, make women less young women, for example, uh, to be precise, less powerful or very powerless when negotiating um, sex. So the stigma around HIV really needs to be broken down from the fact that I'm not sure whether HIV is, is totally classified as a sexually transmitted infection. This is a conversation that we do have a lot because there are other methods or the other modes of transmission of, of HIV, for example. Yeah. And we do not want to talk about all those other aspects. We do not want to talk about how uh, injecting, um, when you're injecting the drugs, you could also be at risk, um, you know, bath, you know, um, sharing uh, sharp needles and stuff. So this is how the, converse, the conversation should be framed. We should move away from stigmatizing sex and everybody who has sex and anybody who wants to talk about sex. It is time to talk, um, as, as Dr. Masha was saying, it is time to, in main, to, to bring the sex education into the mainstream because young people are having it anyway. And it, parents are the ones in denial in this case. They do not want to believe. But a young person will ask you, if God wanted me to have sex, 
during marriage or to wait until marriage, then these hormones should have waited until marriage. Yeah. So we are dealing with a whole lot of situation. Everybody is having their own sources of information. A lot of fallacy around um, everybody being on social media, for example, all young people. We do have a whole group of young people in the rural areas who do not have access to smartphones, who do not have access to internet, who do not, who have to choose between whether it's food today or it's going online. So there is need to even, as we are being consistent, as we are removing the threats, as we are going to where these young people are, we need to also be very inclusive in, in addressing those issues. Yeah, and this is an interesting perspective that you bring in as an HIV and AIDS advocate or activist, mm -hmm. and you don't have to share with me your status if you don't want to, that's okay. Mm -hmm. My only concern is when you talk to the young people out there, they, why do they tell you that this is not a risk to them? Um, yeah. Because sometimes I see they compare. They know some people were infected and they tell you they look good. Yeah, I mean, I look good. <laughs> like like that, that's, that's where it all starts, you know, when, when you show up um, uh, to them and they, they have this eye testing kind of thing. Young people don't go to, to the facility to get tested unless you have done something that makes you feel like you need to go and get tested. If you had sex a one night stand or if you had um, unprotected sex with someone who you don't feel like you're being exclusive with, that is the only way young people go to, to, to go and seek um, the HIV test. So when I say this, I get a lot of, nah, you're lying. I even get told sometimes that the NSDCC has paid me to say that I am like that because we want people to accept us. and. It's a conversation that um, I stopped taking personally and I started using it as an opportunity to tell people that you can still live a normal life. The problem is most of the times, most of the young people haven't tested yet and they do not know their status, whether they're living with HIV or they, they don't have HIV. So when you bring this kind of information to them, you, stigma, you destigmatize the whole HIV issue. You never know how much your reach is going because in most cases, they have someone somewhere in their lives who is also like that, who is also living with HIV and they didn't know how to handle that situation or they themselves are still living in denial or haven't ever, ever tested. I don't know if there are some numbers around, around that with young people on how many of them test, but young people just walk. I personally never thought there was need to test ever until I was very sick and the only way out was to test. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't think I would just walk into a facility and decide to look for the virus in my system, nah. So how did it all happen for you? Did, was it a, an advocacy group? That no. You, did you see something on TV? No. How did you just decide what happened? What happened was actually quite interesting. So I was in high school. I haven't talked about this for a long time, but I was in high school and um, I was in Form 4. And then one day um, I just woke up and I had a whole rush very painful blisters on the stomach area, all that. Um, and then I went to, to my school nurse and she was like, where did you get this from? We need to quarantine you immediately. So I was quarantined for like a day or two. And then uh, she took me to the facility because now she was like my guardian at the point. And she took me to Mata Hospital and yeah, they said there's no need to test. It's obvious what this is. Um, they already knew at that point. Yeah, they, they could just tell because it was at already in some advanced stages could at that point. Could you recollect what had happened? Could you connect it? I mean, I tried to, um, but I did not gather it back because at the time I was 17 years old. So all I just needed to do was understand um, where is this coming from, which I, I don't know yet, and where um, it's going now, what my future looks like from that. Mm. Um, when they tested, they used the two test kits and yeah, I was put on medication, stopped, came back, stopped, came back, and now I'm fully on medication. So more or less like a whole process. How did you it. take that information the moment you were told? I mean, I was 17. If I, I think I would handle it differently right now, but at the time I was just about to do my KCSE, so it looked like an easy way out. You know, When I first met Dr. Masha, I really didn't even have the will to leave, the will to go to school, the will to do nothing at all. Because no matter what you're told on the streets or no matter uh, what somebody else tells you, if they're not living this experience, you don't, you don't take it w with that much seriousness, you know? So I got that information. Um, I went back to school, spoke to a few of my friends, spoke to um, a few of the people at admin um, in the school, 
everybody was very supportive. Um, and then I got into church. And then I prayed it away, but yo, it didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was, yeah, like shakahola things. So I was like away <laughs> from medication for like a month. And then uh, one day during half term, uh, my friends and I, we went to, we went to, yeah, just for the midterm break. And we decided to swap names to test again and see if this happened. Because there was a pastor who came to the school and said, one of you was born with HIV. Oh, da, 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 you've been healed. Oh, and I had faith. You figured that was I, that was me. <laughs> so I, I I stayed off medication for another month, and then it hit back yeah. again. And now the nurse had to take action. She had to now ensure I take meds every day, all that. So it's been a journey through it all to a level where now we literally just take the pill because yeah. I mean there are many ways out of it. And, and you're doing a fantastic job even just having the courage to share that on live TV so that somebody's encouraged out there that it's not a death sentence, it can be managed. But therein lies the concern, Lucy, because when we say that it is not a death sentence and we can clearly show that people are doing well, young people look at any one of you and they're like, Ooh, isn't that where the problem is? So how then do you drum in that message to them? So it's, it's, it's what also Joyce is saying. You, you just have to go get tested. So I remember when I was younger and uh, in this advocacy, boys, I would go to boys' schools, and boys are very naughty. They would be like, I we don't see it anywhere. We don't see it. They're willing so to cute. risk it all. I we, we would. We would risk it. And I'm like, you. Even if it's not me, if it's someone out there, you can't use your eyes to test. It has to be your responsibility to get tested. Because as Jess has said, this is not easy. It's not a walk in the park. It's not something you would choose over, especially when it now comes to relationships. When you want to get into a relationship, you have the burden of, of, uh, of um, telling your story, of letting the other person know, do you know I, I'm living with HIV? And that is not easy. You don't know if this person will stay or if this person will go. Who wants to carry that with them? Uh, you also don't, you don't know what happens when you now want to become a mother or a father. Will your partner accept to have a child with you? Will they risk it all for you? You know, so this, these are the other parts we never get to discuss because probably time never allows us. But that's, that's where the problem now comes in. It's not a walk in the park as, as young people would think that it could be a Aisha. But we also have to speak because we are here. Um, we have 1.6 million people living with HIV in Kenya. So those are people out of the, the 50 million. Those are people, you know, and they have to be accounted for and they have to feel it's not the end of life because if we lost a million people, those are many people. If a young person, um, probably 10 years, have just realized I was born with HIV, what do you want this young person to do? This child, that's a child. Do you want them to give up? No, I want to sh show them that along the way, this will get easier. It's not actually for those who are living negatively. It's really mostly our advocacy for those people who are living with HIV. So you know that it's not the end. You can still pick up your pieces and you can still go. Today, uh, Dr. Ruth, when she was in Dandora, um, since I saw you last time, I now have a book. I've wrote a book, Hope Made Away. Okay. <laughs> and um, we gave the young people in the community this book. It it's really highlights my life. Yeah. And I think there are not even enough stories being told. There are not enough of us being told. Yeah. If I'm coming to this show the second time, yeah. we don't have enough people speaking. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough people living with HIV coming out and feeling good in their skin yeah. and willing to keep on fighting. Yeah. So really, we can't say that because we are saying, um, you know, we, we look good. Yeah. Living with HIV is not the end of life. means we have reached people. People are still facing stigma, especially yeah. self-stigma. People are still f losing their lives over this. That young girl I spoke about, we don't even know where she is. She didn't tell us where she lives, and she left. After yeah. I told her this is something you can't get cured, she left. We don't know if she continued with medication, and it would be so sad to know that we lost her yeah. for any reason whatsoever. So that is the hard part that we have to discuss. And this is only for those who are living with HIV so that they can embrace themselves. How would you summarize your story, Lucy? Because you, you wrote, you've written a book now, and that's commendable. Yeah. It's a fantastic movie you did. How would you summarize your life story? Would you say this was out of peer pressure? Or would you say this was just another ordinary day? What happened in a nutshell? <laughs> Nutshell. <laughs> it's a whole book. <laughs> it's not a nutshell, but uh, just like I mentioned last time, um, I fell in love. 
and I didn't think this was an issue. I was 18, this was my first boyfriend, and I'm thinking, I've waited all this time. They said, I wait until marriage. At least God, let us negotiate. At least I waited until I was 18. Yeah. You have to really, you know, give me my flowers. So if I go with this guy, I promise he's my husband. Uh, I won't look for anyone else, so just, just forgive me for doing this before I went to the altar. But me and you, this is my husband. But that didn't help either. And I didn't know that you should even tell your partner or your boyfriend or your girlfriend that you need to go get tested. That's not a conversation you're told in school, yeah. so we are not still doing enough. That's not a conversation you watch on TV. They, they used to be there, but now it's not there, you know? And Mpimwe, Pamoja. It was a, a picture of a man and a woman, a and a child. So it's for older people. As young people, we don't have to worry. And um, I, I got pregnant. And I got tested, I was still negative, but then later on I became uh, positive and I only knew this when my child was um, three months and he was, he was um, really sickly. So I lost him uh, and also got to know my HIV status. And even in this relationship itself, because we were both kids, uh, violence was, was in the midst of it, you know. Um, this boy, because I can call him a boy, felt, um, strong enough or has power enough over me to hit me. Because he was also learning what he needs out of life and all that. So really, a lot has to be told, but I yeah. think that's a summary. I don't know if it's an yeah. enough yeah, summary. That's, that's a very bold <laughs> summary, and we'll definitely get your book and see what happens there. And, and Said, in the village, and I know you're dealing with people in Kuala most of the time, and Joyce was mentioning something that don't assume everyone is on social media, so it's not so much about peer pressure. But is it a breakdown of communication between parents or even the village elders and the people? Or is it simply the people don't want to listen and they want to do their own things? Like what uh, Lucy is saying, that some of those things are like they're for old people, they're not for young people. Is it a disconnect between the conversation that the parents and the older people are having, or is it that lack of that conversation to begin with? Yes, Trevor, and I think uh, I, I fully agree with that because uh, there is always a breakdown uh, of communication. Live alone in the village, sometimes even in a company or in an organization, there can be a breakdown of communication. There is always a gap. There is a huge gap, actually, between the young people and the elderly because um, uh, there are areas that, uh, as a young person, you are not allowed to go. There are conversation are restricted for you not to speak. Uh, it's, it's very rare you find a parent and a, and a child talking about sexual reproductive health. It's, it's very rare and it's a funny thing, you know, when, when a teacher trying even in class six teaching about sexual and reproductive health sound funny. Uh, when our kids come at home and say, you know, mommy, today we were told about uh, uh, sexual using Condom, you know, that's a very huge conversation that might blow, been blown out of proportion. Today, if my parents, for example, come to my school bag and, for example, they find condoms, one thing they, it will come to them: my kids is uh, my kid is immoral. Instead of uh, thinking that why is he having condoms and why uh, condom at this age, you know, what has he realized behind this condom? The immoral. So I think. I think there is a lot of, what I can say in a very bluntly manner, there is a lot of also pretense and also there is that fear of uh, uh, opening to conversation, having an open conversation like let's talk about sex, let's talk about HIV, let's talk about other STIs. I think people need to break that barrier of communication. Lastly, I think I'll say also, uh, there, there was a time, there was a time, and this is uh, late 90s and even uh, early 2000, you, you will find that uh, the picture, that uh, the advertisement that were being done even in the, in the, in the media about people living with HIV, you, you will see a, a person very skinny, they, they have been uh, put in a post and then you are told, Jaribu uh, Ufe, you know? I don't know, uh, they, they bring the metaphor 
rhetoric of uh, electric power and all that. So I think based on that, I think that message of threat has really synced to the people, that people even fear talking about HIV, people even fear talking about uh, just their own status. And I, I, I agree with my, my colleagues, it's not very, it's not easy yeah. taking a pill every day. You can even uh, test when you are being tested for malaria, severe malaria, and this you appeal to take. You ask, ah, will I take this for a whole week? Now you can imagine taking that pill every day consistently for you to achieve what we call the viral suppression. It's not easy. So I think even as we package the message, I think we've come at a point where by right now we have a lot of ways of packaging the message, a lot of um, uh, prevention measures have come across. And, and, and I really agree with, with Lucy that uh, the message most of the time is for the people who live with HIV. But sometimes also we are told you are HIV positive until you are tested negative. So it is even a challenge to all of us because there is some sort of complacency, yeah. you know, and that language is still there, you know, amekanyaga waya, amekanakalia deposit. You see, such words wow. even make people even fear accessing uh, 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 treatment. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, it, it's simple like you test, you treat, yeah. you know, but how many people are, are willing to to accept the result because it's a simple thing today if a lady goes for a clinic for example they are pregnant they are they have gone for a clinic and they are told you know what for you to continue with your clinic you must test hiv you know yeah. that testing of hiv has become has been proportioned to be a very big deal yeah. so i think people need to come at a a point whereby we neutralize how we give out our messages, okay. we neutralize how do we talk to people whenever they disclose their status, mm. how do we treat them, how do we ensure that they have that proper environment. Even infrastructure, Trevor, yeah. I will tell you, like uh, you go to most of our public facility, they have a, a space where they've uh, set aside, it's known as CCC. Yeah. So for example, example, if I'm going there as Trevor and I'm going to meet, even my re if my relatives work there and I'm going, <laughs> when I go there, people say, ah, these are for that area. You are the, from the room of the CCC. You are the one. So I think we need also to review our infrastructure. Our infrastructure also need to encourage people to access the, the, the medication in case someone turns positive. Okay. However, we need also to elevate yeah. the prevention measures. The prevention aspect need to be really elevated. All right. I'll take a quick break, but Dr. Marshall, let me bring in on this. How does the triple threat relate? How do they relate? Why are we calling it a triple threat? So Trevor, it's a challenge that is layered. Yeah. Or what we call, it's almost what we call the sedemic factors that one makes the other get aggravated. Let me give an example of a pregnancy. Mm. Uh, pregnancy for an adolescent is actually one of the challenges that can take you to a different path than what the child would have actually been. So if the child is exposed to that sexual encounter and then she gets pregnant, if she was struggling for um, pads, she now starts struggling for diapers. If she didn't get HIV within that sexual encounter, mm. then she begin looking for uh, money, for example, uh, to now buy and feed for her child. Mm. Secondly, when, what you see in teen pregnancies across the country is the family breaks. Yeah. Sometimes the girl is chased away. You know, either she's chased to go look for the man, and some of them, we found them in the streets. We now start saying, they are, we call them sex workers, but they're not sex workers, they're girls being sexually exploited. If you talk to those girls, they will tell you that I came here after I got pregnant. So at the bottom of this vulnerability path that you're following, there is a sexual encounter. Trevor then, when this girl at 14 was getting pregnant, what do we call that? Mm. We say it's a pregnancy 
14. But no, it is a violation. It's a defilement because the law is very clear. But then we sometimes say, for example, last year we had about 260,000 uh, children coming to our clinic between the ages of uh, 10 to 19. And this is a, the progress we've made actually after starting to speak about this issue. We came up from about 420,000 in 2018. We've come down to about 360,000 um, in 2021 to now 260,000. So it means that we have 260,000 girls mm. whose education has just been disrupted. Mm by what we then say is a layered challenge. Mm. And then it turned them back either to poverty, and then also, it also makes their own children vulnerable to the same conditions that they're in. Um, we also say it's a layered challenge because if you have to deal with HIV, you need to deal with the sexual exposure for the child. If you have to deal with the uh, adolescent pregnancy, you need to deal with that sexual exposure. And similarly for uh, violence cases, uh, in Nairobi County, we're looking at the data today of the, the girls and the children who are defiled uh, uh, in the year of uh, 2022, how many are actually zero converted? Mm. And you can actually see about 80 of them have zero converted. They've got HIV. And that HIV, we can be sure, came from this violation because by the time they come, we give them a test and then you give them a post-exposure prophylaxis. After three months, you start beginning to see some of them, if they didn't come at the right time to the hospital, they have zero converted. And that is why we say that it has to be all of us addressing this challenge as a layered challenge so that when you go to speak about the pregnancy, don't forget about incest, don't forget about um, defilement, and then also don't forget about HIV. And that's why we said if you have to eliminate this threat from our child, yeah. we'll talk about the triple threat. And then also we see it as a threat to education for these same girls. Okay. But I also want to say that even for the boys, this challenge flows over. Uh, today we met a teen uh, father, you know, and he was saying he impregnated another girl. The his story is almost similar because then he has to start taking care of a baby. and. Uh, uh, maybe what uh, uh, Hamed doesn't told you is that um, uh, he deals with the, the young men who are using drugs and the alcohol and substance abuse. If you go in there, again, there are stories, there are stories of HIV, there are stories that are layered across all the spectrum you're speaking about. And that's why we say it is actually that triple threat. Okay. And it can be multiple threat, but mm -hmm. for the focus that we have currently, it yeah. is that problem that we see. All right. I have to take a quick break here on the Monday report. I see a lot of your feedback coming through. We'll read some of them. When we come back, we now talk about SGBV because it's a triple threat like we mentioned. We'll stay tuned. Keep your views coming at Trevor on Bidjad Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Monday report. See you in just a bit.